Okay, it's my second attempt to get this thing going. Trying to start at 8.30 this morning. All right. Ugh. Done a chin sound check. I'm gonna figure out how to do these sound checks better. Uh, let's see. Well, I'll have my ducks in a row. Don't. Uh, last, I didn't do one last week, guys. Um, hadn't started yet. I'm gonna start start early today. I got to be at church early today, so I'm gonna start early. Did not have any people watch anyway. I mean, not live anyway. Uh, but anyway, uh, I was all ready to go last Sunday, and um, I just felt like. God was putting the brakes on it for some reason. I thought maybe it was just something I need to be doing different, you know, like going off and doing something different completely. But looking back on it now, I think I probably had some stuff in there that was a little too shady. So I screwed up. I screwed up with content and then didn't fix it, I guess. Got it. Got it. What I call a check in the spirit. So. Hopefully this is looking pretty good. I'm trying to come up with something where I can do it on the inside and it not look too boring to you guys. But anyway, pup, 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 pup. It's time for nine o'clock coffee. Morning, guys. It's the 28th of September. It's I got to put the thing in there day. So I don't want this. Oh, it's uh, International Animation Day. And I'm getting a thumbs up for my wife. It, this uh, sound check is <laughs> I have a hard time making sure I'm coming across with sound. Oh, uh, good morning, Terry. How are you? It's Terry Bell from Greenville, North Carolina. Fellow believer. Why well, not a fellow believer? You'd be a girl believer, wouldn't you? <laughs> uh, check by later. Uh, let's see. Oh, to coming up today, preventing bats in your bowel free, zombification, apple and snake, one brain, three minds, ain't nobody got time for that. Dead man living, cats, dogs, and bats. Check by later for links in the description after the stream is over. It's about stuff I'm passionate about, honored at health, humor, science, and God, and you guys. I don't talk, I do, I am political, but I don't talk about politics, and the most of the stuff about God is at the end, so if that creeps you out, then that's when you should. Let zombify down the road. <laughs> Gotta put that in there too. What the day is International Animation Day, created by the International Animated Film Association. Find a lot. Sound is good. Oh, good. Thanks. Video looks good too. Well, I'm hope. Hopefully, the sun when the sun starts rising behind me, I won't fade out. I'm afraid that the uh, the light won't be right. But we'll see what happens. I do have it going on on YouTube too, on but from a different camera, from my Mevo. I figure, I'll, well, I'll tell you about my Mevo in a minute. Uh, let's see. Created by the International Animated Film Association in 2002, the unofficial holiday commemorates the day in 1892 when Charles Emile Renault's 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 theater theatre optique made its first public appearance at the Grevin Museum in Paris, France. Theater optique or optical theater was a machine that used a projector and mirrors to create images on the screen. The images were painted on a ribbon wound on, into a spool. Another spool unwound the ribbon as the images were projected on the screen. Acting as its own projectionist and accompanied by a pianist, Reno showed three cartoons during the show. Each cartoon was 15 minutes long and was created by putting together about 600 individually drawn images on the ri ribbon. Boy, we come a long way. We had to do that now, we probably wouldn't be seeing any animations. Animation is the process of creating moving images by displaying static images in quick succession. Each image differs from the previous image very slightly, and it is these differences that create the movement in the sequence. Traditionally, animated sequences were created by hand-drawn pictures and paintings. Today, technological advances have made it possible for artists to create images directly on a computer or in a pan of water. You can check that out later. With dry erase markers, Learn how to make your own 
animated movies using just your phone or your computer <laughs> or Play to War. Did you know the first animated film was humorous phases of funny faces, humor, humorous phases of funny faces. It was drawn on a chalkboard. It was created by J. Stuart Blackton and came out in 1906. And I'm going to leave a link to that very video so you can watch it. Um, uh, oh, today's mother-in-law day. Uh, I was tempted to tell Matt about that yesterday, but I decided not to. And then tell Lizzie too, because I don't want to, I don't like starting new holidays. <laughs> so it's National Mother-in-Law Day is observed annually on the fourth Sunday in October. It is a special day to honor the mother of your spouse. And this is, this, you, can, you guys can use this to get in good graces if you're not in good graces with your mother-in-law. So you can you know, give her a surprise because she probably doesn't even know it's Mother-in-Law Day. Some people get along very well with their mother-in-law. I think we do. Or yeah, I did. I mean, my wife ended up doing, so we ended well on that. Others not as well. Whichever is the case, this is the day to celebrate them, to celebrate them. <laughs> Whether you make a grand gesture or prefer to keep it simple, take a moment to wish happy mother-in-law day to your mother-in-law. Use hashtag mother-in-law day when posting on social media. This day modeled after Mother's Day was the first observed on March the 5th, 1934 in Amarillo, Texas, where it was initiated by the editor of the local Amarillo newspaper. I wonder if she was in league with Hallmark guards. It's also National Chocolate Day. Now, we do a lot of chocolate around here, but, uh, and I, I don't hold back when I can find a chance to mention it. So I'm not going to go into, here, into real deep, but here's, here's today's five things to know about chocolate. White chocolate originates from the co cocoa plant, or cacao plant, that's what I call it, but it's not chocolate. So white chocolate's not chocolate. Switzerland is one of the top countries for chocolate consumption. The Swiss consume about 22 pounds of chocolate per person per year. I think I consume about a pound of chocolate a week. I mean, it's not sweet chocolate, it's that dark chocolate. So that means I'm consuming about 52 pounds of chocolate a year. Uh, maybe that's what's causing my weight problem. Most cocoa comes from West Africa. I did not know that. I thought it was in South Car South America, and I was sitting there trying to figure out why I thought it was in South America. And number five tells me why. So um, number four, allowing chocolate to melt in your mouth produces the same or even stronger reactions as a passionate kiss. I, I find that hard to believe. Cocoa beans were used as currency by the Mayan and that's number five. Cocoa beans were used as currency by the Mayan and Aztec cultures. Now there's where I thought it was down in South America. Perhaps this is where they say money grows on trees came from. Okay, it's Plush Animal Lovers Day. Also celebrates all plush animals. Plush is a fabric made from materials such as silk, cotton, polyester, and wool that raises to a thickness of at least an eighth of an inch. The term is plush animals or stuffed animals are often used interchangeably as many plush toys are also stuffed. The origin of the day, origin of the day is not known, but it may have been created in reaction to teddy bear picnic day to include more animals besides just teddy bears. The first large scale creation of stuffed toys was done by German, German, I'm trying to remember, but Steiff, yeah. It's kind of hard figuring out German with the E's, I's, and I's. I used to know how to pronounce that. German Steiff Company. I wonder if that's where they got the word stuff from, Steiff. Steiff Company in 1880. One of the first plush animals in the United States was the Ithaca kitten, which debuted in 1892. The teddy bear debuted about a decade later, 1903. So I wonder what the Ithaca kitty looks like. That same year, a stuffed rat, Peter Rabbit was patented. Another early stuffed animal was the sock monkey. Now that's back. I've seen sock monkeys all over, which became popular during the Great Depression. Oh, see, Linus said hi. Oh, thank, hi, Linus. So, that sounds good. Oh, great. You guys holler out of it and screws up. I appreciate it. I'll take my mic off and just use the camera, camera uh, sound. But I got it. Whenever I watch this stuff after I'm doing it, and it's not with mics, I'm going, I don't even want to watch it. It's, it sounds just so bad. And I see it on YouTube like that a lot. People talking and it sounds terrible. 
It's pumpkin day. It's National Pumpkin Day. Pumpkins are the harbinger of the harvest season, appearing every year as the first sign of autumn. Did you know that there are over 45 different varieties of pumpkin? They range in color from white to red to even blue. Pumpkins can be grown on every continent except Antarctica. But you can do it if you concentrated, kept it inside. And the United States produces about 1.5 billion pounds of them each year. A Wisconsin farmer grew the largest pumpkin ever recorded, used seaweed, cow manure, and fish emulsion to grow his pumpkin, which weighed a total of 1,810 pounds and was the size of a dumpster. Create National Pumpkin Day by carving a pumpkin in time for Halloween. Don't forget to take the pumpkin seeds for a healthy autumn snack. I've been eating pumpkin seeds in my snacks. I've been, my, my wife gets these uh, this stuff you put on your salad that's got seeds and stuff in it. And I, I, she was always getting on me because I'd be eating it. And she said, that's for salads. Stop eating it. So I made her give me two more bags so I can snack on them. And they got pumpkin seeds in them. They're really good for parasites. Uh, Saints... Is, today is also St. Jude's Feast Day and Statue of Liberty Dedication Day. And I got a little history on that one. On October 28, 1886, the Statue of Liberty was officially dedicated in a day-long celebration led by President Grover Cleveland. The festivities included a land parade through Manhattan, a naval parade on the Hudson River, and an unveiling ceremony on Bedloe's Island. Although not a complete washout like the dedication of the pedestal cornerstone two years prior, the weather on October the 28th was not ideal for New Yorkers to catch a glimpse of Lady Liberty as she was covered in a dense fog that only began to let up later in the afternoon. The land parade began around 9 a.m. in the morning with militia, militiamen from the National Guard appearing on Fifth Avenue in Madison Square where President Cleveland, Cleveland was perched in a reviewing stand with the statue's designer, Frederick Bartholdi. The parade, which wound its way through the street, city streets yesterday, and this is from the newspaper, the parade, which wound its way through the city streets yesterday, was one of the largest ever seen, and it was notable for the amount of enthusiasm which it evoked. The display of banners and flags and similar devices were remarkable for its variety. The marshals, commanders, and officers of all civic divisions carried the French colors, in many instances wound around their chests and sashes. Uh, I'm going to leave the rest of this little narrative up, up top for y'all to read because it gets kind of long and we got a lot to get through. But it was, it was pretty interesting. It even had a little bit of humorous politics in there. Um... It's also visit a cemetery day today, right before Halloween, with wrought iron fences, granite headstones, monuments and crypts. Cemeteries have been shrouded with dark and often macabre, 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 macabre symbolisms. Read and don't pronounce enough symbolism that has generated the attention of melancholics and incurable romantics. And don't forget the goth. I imagine the goth people are really into this stuff too. Grief seekers and professional mourners, but the ceremony, the cemetery as a repository for the dead is now being redefined with the first annual Visit a Cemetery Day on Saturday, October the 29th. No, Sunday. Sunday, October. That's today, whatever. This is an old write-up. <laughs> uh, well, I like cemeteries. My favorite, I think, is the one in Beaufort. And I was talking to somebody uh, recently who's from Beaufort, and they were saying that it's really in a mess because of the hurricane so it's also wild foods day it's wild foods day is a celebration of wild plants fruits and vegetables humans have been eating plants and harvesting food and wild for thousand harvesting food from the wild for thousands of years due to a popular trend wild plants now often appear on menus in the gourmet restaurants and raw food restaurants wild foods are free of preservatives and pesticides and eating them is part of an eco-friendly lifestyle lifestyle today take part in an old age tradition and take a walk in the woods to find some edible wild plants to eat make sure you learn how to properly identify and prepare the wild plants before you consume them you should also learn where to find them and if they have nutritional value happy wild foods day um dandelions you can eat dandelions all of that is edible we we've had dandelion root coffee which is a coffee substitute stimulates the liver, not the uh, adrenal glands. So, you, but you do you get an energy kick, but not not the same kind. 
Uh, it's also good for detox and liver. What else do we eat? Uh, we eat plantain too. You can put that on your salad. We use that for poisons. Um, but there's a book that you can get. And I'll put a link to that um, that helps you identify what um, are edible wild plants. On this day in 1919, U.S. Congress passes the Volstead Act, the act enumerated ways to enforce prohibition. So pro prohibition was happened happened today. Prohibition was put in place in the country by the 18th Amendment to the Constitution. The amendment made it illegal to produce, sell, or transport alcohol in the U.S. except for medical or religious purposes. The act was named after Andrew Volstead, the chairman of the House Judiciary Committee. That's who he was. He was one of the sponsors of the bill. Prohibition ended with a ratification of the 21st Amendment in 1933. So the 21st Amendment was 1933, and the 18th was in 1919. So that means in four years they had gone through four constitutional, three constitutional amendments. Now I got I got a list of these constitutional amendments that's happened there because I thought I was really curious to see when that they happened. Um, because right now we're on the, we just, the 27th is the last one that was been done. The, the, the interesting thing about them is they had the dates on this chart on when they were um, proposed and when they were ratified. Most of them, see, the, the, the 22nd was, took three years from proposal to ratification, then nine months, then one year, then one year, seven months, four days, then three months, eight days. The last one, the 27th one, which was ratified in 1992, was proposed in 1789, 202 years before, between the, the time it was proposed and the time it was ratified. Can you guess what the constitutional amendment was? <laughs> it was to delay laws affecting congressional salary from taking effect until after the next election of the representatives. Nobody wanted to vote themselves out of a pay increase during their session. So it took 202 years from to get enough people to, to get that going, to get, it, to get us all to vote on it. National Cat Day is Monday. Tuesday is National Candy Corn Day. Now that's genius, because that's the day before Halloween. So the day, your candy day is the day before Halloween. So everybody, you can, I can see the advertisements. I mean, go out and buy some candy corn. It's National Candy Corn Day. Well, it must have worked, because candy corn is probably one of the most popular Halloween uh, candies out there, I think. Wednesday's National Caramel Apple Day and Reformation Day. And Reformation Day, so that's the day that uh, uh, Martin Luther Tacked his the thesis his thesis on the Catholic door the day the day the Protestant Church began basically is what that is it's also Halloween of course Thursday is All Saints Day that's the the day after Halloween of course and Friday is Look for Circles Day I didn't look into why I was Look for Circles Day but Saturday Saturday is National Housewife Day that's the day that you can uh, treat your wife really special it's also National Sandwich Day so you can say Hey, wife, happy National Housewife Day. Now go make me a sandwich. National Sandwich Day. And that's the rest of the story. Uh, let's see. I've been trying to keep track of how, how long I've been going on here. 23 minutes? Yeah, it's taking a while. This is going to be a long one, guys. I'm sorry. I got material from last week and this week and this one. What's going on? Well, God stuff. What you laughing out loud about, Terry? <laughs> What's going on? Well, I've been having big discussions with guys online uh, about uh, God stuff, I guess. And that's been, that's really been interesting. Uh, uh, stuff about what, when Adam sinned, um, whether the Bible is true or not. Wifey sandwich. Oh. <laughs> um that's interesting. That was an interesting discussion. Also, I've been only working 24 hours a week. That's, a, that's uh, my kind. Con I lost a contract. I don't know if I mentioned that before. I lost a contract, so my hours have been reduced to 25, 20, 24 hours a week. Uh, I'm not worried about it, though. And uh, I got a aha mo mo moment with my Mevo. Turn the picture straight in my camera. 
uh, it turns out my camera is not compatible with Amiibo. So that's why the sound problem, I was having sound problems. I'm surprised Amiibo didn't tell me that because I told him exactly what kind of hardware I had. So I'm going to have to upgrade to my camera to get an Amiibo to work. Although I, I'm working it now, it's, it's doing the YouTube video, uh, YouTube stream, but I'm using a mic that's wired directly to the camera so it's not going through my phone. Um, a frog gets alone. There's a joke about a frog gets alone. This is uh, Norm McDonald. I've kind of been watching a lot of his stuff lately. He is hilarious to me. But Norm, Norm gets, I watched this video, Norm gets a cat, and it's pretty, pretty funny. So I'm going to put a video for that to watch. Uh, we finished watching Man in the High Castle. That's a slow-moving uh, sci-fi. Uh, it's got a lot of rude stuff in it. It's in a Netflix thing, so you got to watch it through uh, VidAngel if, you're, if that kind of stuff offends you. Uh, but we finished watching it. But let's talk about parallel universes. So it's kind of interesting. Kind of reminded me. Kind of reminds me of um, Fringe in a way. But in this parallel universe, which is where it mo up to now mo everything is or near about. I'd say 99% of the stuff took place. Uh, the Nazis in Japan actually won World War II, and the United States is occupied by uh, the Germans up to the uh, Rocky Mountains, and then Japan, well, not Rocky Mountains, before Rocky Mountains, maybe Mississippi River, and then there's a neutral zone in between Mississippi River and the and the, uh, the mountains, and then Japan Japan's in possession of west of California. And there's a lot of, it's a really interesting show, but it, it does move at a slow pace. Um, whiteboard animation apps, I've been looking into those. They've been kind of interesting. Those are the ones where they, you can see the hand drawing on the whiteboard. There's a, bunch, there's a bunch of apps doing that. So that's some animation. I'll give you a link to uh, an app for doing that. Um, also, cordyceps keep coming to mind whenever I see the zombies in Halloween. And cordyceps, is, there's going to be a link down below on what cordyceps are, but basically they're very eerie in that they, what they do is they, they infect an animal and cause them to think in a, such a way that perpetuates the infection, <laughs> kind of like a zombie. And one of the, the most popular ones, I guess, is, a, is the ant. A fungus infects this ant and makes the ant crawl up high, and this happens in the rainforest, crawl up high on a branch and latch itself onto the branch where it dies and the fungus continues to grow. And then it grows and produces spores that shower the uh, floor below with the spores that would infect other ants. So when an ant Actually, you'll see this video, but it's kind of interesting. This so when an ant no, another ant realizes that this this ant uh, uh, ant B has been infected by this fungus. It's basically a zombie ant. They grab the ant and they take it away from them somewhere and dump it so that it won't climb up and infect them. <laughs> it's so crazy to me, but it made me think about cat ladies. I was wondering if cat ladies. These ladies that, you know, when they pass away, they find out they got like 200 cats in their house. I wonder if they're getting infected by some kind of virus from the cats that make them want to collect cats. <laughs> I, I, I'm, I think I might be hitting on something on there. Because there are a lot of parasites you can get from cats. Anyway, uh, I wanted to, to tell you all about zombies because zombies are a thing. They are a thing, but they're not the thing that you see in, on TV. Uh, what would happen? And I couldn't find the original story. I, I saw this in a book at a at a cottage that we were renting for uh, the summer or for our vacation. But basically, what would happen with zombies? I'll tell you just briefly. Zombies aren't dead people, not real zombies. But people that see the people in the culture think they are dead people that brought back to life. What happens is is a witch doctor pick somebody that they want to make a zombie and they'll poison them with this poison that gives them sleep paralysis, a paralysis. It's kind of like sleep paralysis. I'll tell you about that in a minute. It gives you paralysis, paralyzes them and causes their breathing to go down to nothing. So they look dead. So the people, the people that love them and know them think they're dead and they take them and they put them in the, in a coffin and they stick them in the ground and they bury them. But as soon as they're buried, the witch doctor comes and digs up the person. Now, the whole time this is going on, the person that has been drugged has got this paralysis and, is, and can't breathe. They're aware. They're conscious. 
So when they can't move and all that kind of stuff, they actually think they're dead. And they're putting the coffin and they're putting in the ground. And I imagine they're freaking out, but they can't move. So the witch doctor comes and digs them up and takes them back to, to his hut and gives them a drug that wakes them up, but also keeps them drugged. And so they think, and the, the witch doctor tells them, hey, I got you out of the ground. You were dead. I got you out of the ground. I gave you this medicine. I gave you this, this thing or I've done this magic to you so that now you're alive. But you're, you know. So the zombie thinks that he's dead and brought back to life by the witch doctor. The witch doctor keeps him drugged. The witch doctor tells the zombie that if he doesn't keep on giving him the drug, then he'll end up being not being able to move and you'll be useless. I'll, I'll bury you again. So he keeps on taking the drug. And he, they do work for the, the witch doctor. And then whenever a loved one, a loved one might see their their loved one on the side of the road doing some kind of work for their witch doctor, you know, do, see him around and stuff, and they think, you know, he's a zombie. So that's where zombies come from. Sleep paralysis. A lot of y'all might have had that happen to you. It's inability to... Uh, I heard they do. I heard they do on a science program. Or you heard they do what, Terry? Um, sleep paralysis. You might have had that happen to you. It's happened to me a lot. I kind of. I've gotten kind of sick on it. I guess I kind of enjoy it sometimes. But you, what happens is it's a stage of sleep where you go through where you uh, your body doesn't. It shuts down from, from moving you, yourself moving your moving the body and the reason it does that is because everything you dream we would cause you to move move your body if you didn't do it oh the cat lady oh they talked about that hmm. um so but if you're if you're conscious when you go through sleep paralysis all of a sudden you're you're awake and you can't move so it's a lot like what the zombies kind of went through i guess except for your breathing i guess so you're disconnected from your body. In a way, you're dead to your body. And see, see the God stuff below when I'm talking about that, when I say dead to your body. I've been hankering for some Blade Runner. Watching the old Blade Runner. I found out recently, and this is kind of mine, it blew my mind, that Deckard is a replicant. I had no idea. According to the director, he's a replicant. According to Harrison Ford, he's not a replicant. According to the author, it's more, it's kind of like he doesn't really want you to know if he's a replicant or not. I think is the way it went. Anyway, that's why I went. Cats can affect cat owners, as you said. Yes. Oh, really? Oh, nice. Thanks, Terry. They blinded me with science. Lifting negative mass. Now, this, this isn't uh, poo-pooing science this is just some real science lifting negative mass what would it be like to lift negative mass uh snakes serpents and dragons or dinosaurs a lot of people kind of criticize scripture because they say there's you know there are young earthers because they say there's no dinosaurs in scripture um but there are, are dinosaurs in scripture they were just referred to as dragons um this is a video on this, snakes, serpents, and dragons or dinosaurs. Also, snakes and serpents, a lot of times, you know, a serpent in the garden is what tempted Eve, and a lot of times we think of that as a snake, but a snake isn't a serpent necessarily, and a serpent isn't a snake. A snake is a type of serpent, but serpents can be other things. You know, in, in Revelation, Satan is referred to as the dragon, so if he's the, a snake in the garden and a dragon, or is he a serpent in both, both places? Also, there's a video of Uptown Spot. This is Uptown Funk, the dancing robot dog dancing to the song Uptown Funk. <sighs> Crazy. In case you missed it, Sarah's Movie Roundup. She did a review. I did not go see this movie. I can't remember why. I think it was just because I thought it was a scary movie. I'm not into scary movies. And they've been watching a lot of scary movies lately, so that's been missing it. But they went and saw Bad Times at El Royale. And she's got a review, and she really liked the movie. She liked it a lot. She wants to go back to it. So it to be a five-star in my rating system. She's got a different rating system than I do. 
Mr. Mom, and I forgot why I have this one in here, but Scars, Michael Keaton, Terry Gar, Martin Mull, and Ann Jillian. Hadn't seen her in a while. I don't know if she's still around or if had passed away. And Christopher Lloyd, I don't remember him being in there. But there's a trailer. A lot of you guys, you young guys, know Michael Keaton from superhero movies and as playing serious roles. But at one time, he was what I called a stand-up comic. But I watched one of his comedy routines, and he's not really a stand-up stand comic. He's really a stand-up, uh, what's the word? Well, you'll see. The name of the, the, name of the video has it. <laughs> he's not really a comic, although he's funny. He's, yeah, I guess you would make it. He doesn't tell jokes. He doesn't. He basically, what's the word? Not impressions is uh, when you innovate, you're given something to do, and you you have to make it up. And the actors do it all the time. That made that explains why he was such a great actor because that's what he was doing. He was just doing things that was funny. Watch this. Watch the video. You'll see. Uh, also, the Great Pumpkin. There's actually a link to a YouTube video that is the full episode of the Great Pumpkin, so y'all can watch that. Blade Runner, and this is for guys and snakes. It stars Harrison Ford, Rutger Hauer. Sean Young and Edward James Olmos. And it's uh, this is for Living Man Walking. Did I go over those things? Living Man Walking? I think I did. Anyway, this, this movie became a lot better to me when I found out, when I discovered what noir was from watching all these old black and whites. Because this is what this is, is a science fiction noir uh, movie. And when you watch it, with knowing it's noir, it be, all of a sudden becomes a lot better, a lot better watch. And here's the, the trailer. Uh, there's, there'll be a trailer. Um, the thing about uh, this this movie was that was really amazing to me was Rutger Hauer's monologue. Uh, he he didn't say what he was supposed to say. I'm going to say I'm going to read what he was supposed to say. I have known adventures, seen places you people will never see. I've been off world and back frontiers. I've stood on the back deck of a blinker bound for the plutician camps with sweat in my eyes, watching the stars fight on the shoulder of Orion. I felt wind in my hair, riding test boats off the black galaxies and seen an attack fleet burn like a match and disappear. I've seen it, felt it. And it reminds me a lot of this whole scene reminds me a lot of Ecclesiastes because Ecclesiastes is basically a book in scripture that talks about what it's like to live on earth without an awareness of God. Basically we're dead to God. And like I said, if you want to find out what I mean by dead to God, you just check out the God stuff down below as I keep going. Um, but, and I, I'm thinking he was supposed to read that in about a minute because the, the, the monologue that he did was one he made up the night before, and it was so much better than this one. And it's unbelievable how long he took to see it. If you see it written out, you can, I'll, put, I'll post it, what he said written out up above too. But it took him 50 seconds to say what he said. And it's not that like a 30 word sentence maybe or a couple a few 30 word sentences uh, but it, it it was a pretty good monologue it's, it's been talked about by a lot of people as being the monologue the monologue of the movies the thing this is uh guys this is not the dog this is for guys the thing and i'm not gonna put who was in it because it was so long ago Black Mirror. This is another guy's one. Not the dog. This is Metalhead. This is this is a, 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 a an episode of Black Mirror where there is a dog similar to uh, the spot that yeah, was up there dancing. And um, there's a trailer and a review of the trailer. Primer. You'll need all three of your minds for this one, guys. You know, three minds with one brain. This one's a time travel one. This ain't got no, ain't got time for that. It's a celebration of the mind day that was for last week, but it's apropos for this week. You can see the trailer on that. Safety not guaranteed. This is a rom-com time travel, so this ain't got time for that. Starring Aubrey Plaza, Mark du Duplass, Jake Johnson, Karen Sony, Jenica Berger, and Kristen Bell. I'll put all those other names because I recognize Kristen Bell. 
Jeff Garland and Mary Lynn Rad Radscope. This is an independent film, and it's really one that, in case you probably you may have missed this one, this is it's pretty good. Midnight in Paris, another rom-com, ain't got time for that, starring Kathy Bates, Adrian Brody, Carla Bruni, Marion Cotillard, I got to figure out how to pronounce her name, Rachel McAdams, Michael Sheen, and Owen Wilson. There was another guy in there. I, I can't remember who it was. He's famous now. I'll have to put that in there later. YouTube this, Iodine. Uh, this is a thing about how critical iodine is for our system and what, what we can do to get rid of our being poisoned by chlorine and all that other stuff. It's not good for fluorine, chlorine, fluoride, and all that kind of stuff's not good for you. And this iodine actually will drive it out. It's a video on how to do that. What the heck? Caramel apple cheesecake, simply because it's caramel apple day next week, and I like cheesecake. And since I like cheesecake, I got a, a video on how to make Boston cream pie cheesecake. Cheesecake stuffed pumpkin bread. A video on which is better, coconut oil versus olive oil. I started drinking olive oil again last week because of this video. And cancer lives is on sugar and dot, 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 dot. This is a clickbait. You got to click on it to find out what, what else cancer lives on besides sugar. Tricking your brain into learning more. It's a TEDx talk on how to trick your brain into learning more. It has to do with the one brain, three minds. What the tech? The state of robots. A video on that. Robots making robots. Another video on how, well, not video. I think this is an article on how China's got robots making robots. This is getting close to what it would be like if you got artificial intelligence and robots making robots. And then the finishing touch will be robots designing robots. We got artificial intelligence with robots designing robots and robots making robots. We're going to be in trouble. Uh, bringing the extinct back to life, a video on how they can do that, and dinosaur blood, about how they're finding soft tissue dinosaur blood and other kinds of tissues and all kinds of dinosaur, dinosaur fossils. It's kind of sh shooting <clears throat> an old earth dinosaur type of belief in the foot. Mr. Know-it-all, cordyceps. So you can learn all about cordyceps and be able to impress everybody over Halloween about your knowledge of cordyceps. Okay, now we're into the God stuff, and I'm way behind. See, I've been doing this for 40 minutes. Good grief, and i got a lot of God stuff. The God stuff, I'm just going to be going through it pretty quick. Uh, I'll, I'll be given uh, scripture verses to check back by on, but in a, uh, um, it's my apologies. I just get going on this stuff and can't stop. The disclaimer, so you check this stuff out for yourself. You don't, and feel free to correct me if you think I'm wrong. I, uh, you can do that down below, or you can send me a message, or you can send me an email, um, whichever way you want to do. Because uh, a lot of this stuff doesn't really fit with what you would call traditional, not traditional, institutional Christianity, I guess. You don't mean it. What Sovereign. Sovereign's a big one. People use the word sovereign as if it means God is in complete control of everything, and that's not what the word sovereign means, although I do believe God is sovereign. The religious meaning is in control, in complete control. Really just mean, sovereign just really means king or the one in the highest authority. You can tell when someone uses it with the religious meaning because when you talk to them about it, you know, kind of poke them around trying to see where they stand on it, they'll, they'll use phrases such as God is completely sovereign which when translated means God's completely king, which doesn't really make sense. A friend of mine, Carlo, uh, who's into this same kind of stuff I am, he posted this last, last week. Um, so I'm giving him credit for this because it was really good. I, I, I used it in one of my discussions that I was having with a guy. <clears throat> Carlo says, I love preaching about God being in charge and not in control. Now, when you hear that and not in control, that really kind of make you, feathers or hair on the back of your neck bristle, doesn't it? Not, God's not in control. Uh, I love preaching about God being in charge and not in control. This, however, doesn't mean he can't take control because he can do anything. So it's, and he can. He didn't say that. I said that. <laughs> but he, he doesn't just do anything since he is love. Love does not insist on having its own way. 
So love doesn't force others. We have free will. If we don't have free will, if God is completely sovereign and everything happens because he wants it to happen, then we no longer have free will. That's what it amounts to. This is 1 Corinthians 13, 4 through 6. Love is patient. Love is kind and is not jealous. Love does not brag and is not arrogant. It does not act unbecomingly. It does not seek its own. It is not provoked. It does not take into account a wrong suffered. It does not rejoice in unrighteousness, but rejoices with the truth. God hasn't just been loving, though. He has other attributes. The only reason we, only, we there's a reason we don't see his other attributes today. In the past, at times, he took control just as good earthly king would. You know, if something really bad happened to somebody's kingdom, the king would take control and do something. He'd send his, his military out and have stuff done. But people in the kingdom still had free will. It's just that God would, I'm not God, the king, the king would interject and stop certain things. And just as just as a good king would do that, a good earthly king would do that, God does it. And it includes judgment, punishment, and wrath. Those are referred to as strange works, strange works he performed to make right, make things right and to accomplish his plan. Sin or error, wrong, uh, being wrong, missing the target, that's what the word sin means, is the reason for his strange work. In Isaiah 28, 21, you read, for the Lord shall rise up as in Mount Perizim, he shall be wroth as in the valley of Gibeon, that he may do his work, his strange work, and bring to pass his act, his strange act. The reason we don't see all that today is because all of his wrath was poured out on Jesus. First John 14. At the cross, Jesus took our sin upon himself. He paid the penalty for our sin. He became our substitute. At the cross, God's justice was satisfied and his love fulfilled. Then Jesus said, it is accomplished, and he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Oh, I forgot to tell you, I had my coffee. That's for YouTube. Let's see, here's you guys, and then there's YouTube up there. Uh, I didn't even have any. It's black. Uh, we live in a great time where God's wrath has been exhausted on Jesus for the sins of the world and sin in general. 2 Corinthians 5.21, he made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God. And this is Colossians 2.13-14. And you, being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to the cross. Today, God has poured out his wrath on Jesus for our sake. So there's nothing you, you can really do to get God to be to pour his wrath on you because he's already poured it all out on eating, exhausted it out on Jesus for Jesus' sake and his brides, thus who believe he has poured out his spirit on all flesh. So his wrath, all his wrath was poured out on Jesus and all his spirit has been poured out on all flesh. This doesn't mean just on Christians as some want it to mean the verse is a fulfillment of a prophecy in Joel that was to the Jews. So if it was just to, to Christians, then uh, there wouldn't have been a prophecy in Joel about pouring it out on all flesh. If flesh means Jews, the flesh either means just Jews or it means everybody. But just as Jesus has taken sin out of the way, atoned for everyone's sin, uh, uh, got that out of place. Anyway, we live in a great time. This time right we're living in right now, there's no wrath. God does not pour out his wrath on anybody. And he's poured out his spirit on everybody. So 1 John 2, 2, And he is the propitiation of our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. So Jesus died for not only for the sins of the believer, but for sins of the whole world. So everybody's sins are forgiven. That doesn't mean we go out and sin willfully. It just means they're forgiven. It, the scripture talks about it. It's just, 
may it never be when they say, should, this, should we go out and sin since it's already paid for and God gets more? Well, I'm not going to get into that. So all I'm trying to do is show us that, show you that we have the state of all the spirit poured out on all flesh, upon all flesh, not in all flesh, upon all flesh. All of our sins are forgiven. Everybody's in the world's sin is forgiven. So we're in that state. Now that doesn't mean they're all Christians. He's poured out his spirit on all flesh. Don't let us understand. A Christian has the spirit within and upon him, while all flesh has just the spirit upon. Sort of like the way it happened in the Old Testament. The spirit would come on, come on the Old Testament saints and then leave again. <clears throat> uh, David said uh, something. He's got some psalm where he talks about. Bring back your spirit. <laughs> For a believer, the spirit's never taken away. John 20, 21. And again, Jesus said, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them, received the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, their sins are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. Here, the disciples became born again. Just as God breathed his spirit into Job and Genesis, the risen Christ breathes into his disciples, the Holy Spirit, they have the spirit in them, but they didn't have yet have the spirit upon them. They had it in them, but not upon, because the upon happened at Pentecost. They were to wait in Jerusalem for that. That happened in Acts, Acts 2, Acts 2, 1. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. And in Acts 2.15, um, we read, For these are not drunken, as ye suppose, seeing it is but the third hour of the day, but this is that which was spoken of by the prophet Joel. And it shall come to pass in the last days, saith God, I will pour out of my Spirit upon all flesh. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. I've been hearing about a lot of different people in different religions that have been dreaming about Jesus. And dreaming about Jesus and having Jesus dreams. I, I, there's a testimony below by one uh, in the video, Ahava. Uh, if I don't mention it, it's in the second, second video um, in the uh, Jesus on the Streets. Uh, and dream dreams, and then, and on my servants, now here he's talking about Christians, and on my servants, and on my handmaidens, I will pour out in those days of my spirit, and they shall prophesy. So how can he pour out his spirit on sinful man too, though? Because, because sin has been removed as a barrier because of Jesus taking it out of the way. First John 2, 2, and he is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. I did that one before. Got that one out of place somehow. Not only that, but God has given everyone the measure of faith. Faith is the supernatural ability to believe in what is not seen. You can see that in Hebrews 11.1. 1. Now, faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. So, as an unbeliever, you have the Spirit of God on you. I'm beginning to think that's what our conscience is. I'm thinking that there wasn't a conscious, like, I mean, I think the Holy Spirit came upon people and left a lot. But I think the, the conscience is what we have today is not what existed before Jesus' resurrection. I think the, the whole reason everybody has conscience is it's because of the Holy Spirit. I'm just kind of thinking about this. So I'm not ready to call that a doctrine yet. But uh, not only that, but God has given everyone the measure of faith. So we got faith. Everyone's got faith. Everyone has the spirit upon them, witnessing to them. And we're given the faith to believe what the this Holy Spirit witnesses to us. So when a believer shares the gospel with someone who's lost, God's spirit rests on him and witnesses to his spirit that what is being said is true. If he then believes by the faith given him, the most miraculous thing in the universe happens. He becomes born from above. You become, we become the righteousness of God through Jesus. We literally become God's house. He, he actually moves in. 1 Corinthians 6.19. 
Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit? And the temple is just the word house, that your body is a house of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and that you are not your own. The Spirit of God moves in and gives us a new incorruptible spirit that is in, inextricably entangled in his. I love that phrase. I, I know it sounds kind of pointy-headed. Inextricably entangled. That means they're entangled into a mess. I mean, it's a, to the point that you can't identify one or the other. It, and in, entangled and inextric, inextricably <laughs> means it's, it's something that's impossible to un, untangle. A new heart. He gives us a new heart and he seals us up for himself. This is Ezekiel 36, 26 through 27. Moreover, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I, and I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and you will be careful to observe my ordinances. This is Ephesians 1, 13 through 15. In Christ, ye also trusted after you heard the word of truth. See, I'm, let you know, I'm doing pretty good. Uh, in Christ, you also trusted after you heard the truth, word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after ye believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, which is the pledge of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of his glory. The redemption of the purchased possession, that's us, spirit, soul, and body. Spirit, soul, and body. Unto the praise of his glory. We're sealed. Through this miraculous gift, the relationship that was spoiled by Adam is more than restored. <clears throat> Our final state is greater than Adam's original one. We are joined at the hip with God. We are signed, sealed, delivered. We're his. Remember that song? Signed, sealed, delivered, I'm yours. Sermonette. Preventing bats in your belfry. Uh, um, I, I got to give... Uh, um, I had I talked to some guys last week who said they missed my thing last, last Sunday. One of them I was talking to about we were talking about memories and how they they kind of creep up on us and and it caused me to wince. You know, I'll remember something I shouldn't have done, and it keeps making me wince. And we got to talking about um how to how to deal with that. And it came to my mind that we should be treating that a lot like, well, eh, let me just do this. Sermonette, preventing bats in your belfry. You can't keep bats out of your hair, but you can keep them from nesting in your belfry. Where do bad thoughts come from? A bat, a bat is a bad thought. Where do bad thoughts come from? The world, the flesh, and the devil are the three places they come from. They either come from outside, from like watching something, hearing somebody talk or something like that, or from your own flesh, or the devil can interject a thought. Bad thought comes in as an idea to sin. Some have no, no, no temptation. I used to sit in church and uh, daydream about how to rob a bank and not get caught. I wasn't tempted to do it, but it was it was a thought. And I, I, and I sat there and thought on it, and I'd miss the sermon a lot. <laughs> it's kind of interesting. Some are repugnant. You might say, ooh, gross when you think of it, or when that thought comes in your head. So it's not even a temptation. That's nowhere near the, the, a temptation. And then there are thoughts that are appealing, and that's because of our sin nature. And you kind of go, wow, I like that thought, even though I might know, think it's wrong. The thought has an appeal to it. Now, those are the, these are the thoughts you got to worry about. And, the, and when, it be, when does it become sin, though? Did it come, become a sin when you thought of it? Sin must be prece preceded by temptation, according to Scripture. Scripture shows the steps to sinning in James 1, 13 through 15. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted by evil, and he is himself not does not tempt anyone. But each one is tempted when he is carried away and enticed by his own lust. Now, lust all that word lust means is strong feeling of desire. That's all that means. But each one is tempted when he is carried away and enticed by his own lust. Then when lust has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And when sin is accomplished, 
it brings forth death. So there's your steps. Scripture says that everyone goes through the following, those, those steps. And I'm going to list the steps below. Follow, these, these, these five following steps. All but one, that is, and that's Jesus. Jesus made it, has gone through the first two steps. I think it's the first two steps. I'll correct that if I'm wrong. Yes. Jesus went through the first two steps, but we never, we at least one time in our life go through all five because the wages of sin is death and we all deserve to die. We're all sinners. We all had the sin seed in us. That's why the thought to do something bad seemed good to us. If we didn't have that sin seed in us, that thought wouldn't have had no effect on us. But thanks to Adam, we have, we're born as sinners. First step is the thought. The, the bad thought arrives and leaves. It arrives either through the world, the flesh, or the devil. And it leaves if it's neutral over your head or repugnant. It's in your hair. You can get a bat in your hair. Ah, a bat over your head, you might not even know it, but a bat in your hair. Whoo. If it revisits enough or you're compromised by alcohol or drugs, it becomes less neutral and you may end up being tempted. Tempting. In your belfry. It may get in your belfry. It's not too late. You open up your belfry when you, you drop your guard. And some things that you, you thought were gross or you were neutral it may, may, not, it may not be. So that's a good reason not to get drunk. <clears throat> it's still not too late. No sins happened yet, though. Just having the thought, that's not sinning. Got to be tempted first. Step two is temptation. You make it here by default if the thought was pleasing. The bat in your belfry is a pleasing bad thought. While you could take thoughts captive in step one, it's you could have thought, taken a thought captive in step one. It's serious business to take it captive here. <clears throat> it's not sin when the thought gets you here. Where's my, got my clear my throat juice. Um, it's not sin when the thought gets here. Hebrews 4.15, for we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tempted on all things as we are, yet without sin. This is a verse to show you that Jesus always makes has made it to step two for all temptations. Anything that we're tempted in, Jesus has been tempted in, but did not sin. Okay, <clears throat> step three is lust. Because you don't take action, because you didn't bring that lat, that bat into captivity and continue to use the thought to entertain, you continue to use the thought to entertain yourself, you're basically feeding the bat. You magnify it until it becomes a bad, lustful thought. It basically, you're, you increase the intensity of the emotion behind the thing you're thinking about. It was just maybe been just slightly pleasing when you first thought of it. It gets to be a grown pregnant bat in this stage. It's been in, it's in your belfry. You've been feeding it and it's pregnant. You continue to think about when you continue to think about something, it magnifies it, it makes it bigger, it makes it more gives it more umph. That's why people obsess, you know, you got a girlfriend or a boy for a girl you had a crush on or a boy you had a crush on, and you sit there and think about them, they just get bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. It's just the more you think about them, that's the that's what magnify when you read it in scripture. That's what it means. In Psalm 69, 30, I will praise the name of God with song and magnify him with thanksgiving. So it's a slippery slope. It's not too late for a believer to keep from sinning, although much more difficult because you've just now you got this almost like a habit going of feeding this bat. Lust, the bad version of it anyway, there's a good version of lust, is a bad thought married to a strong desire. Lust is a bad thought married to a strong desire and marriages produce offspring. And this illustration, and the offspring is not more bats, but guano. Sin is guano. Sin, you're in step four. When lust conceives, it gives birth to sin. Now it's too late. The birthing is you actually doing the thought you had a strong desire to do. That's when you actually sin. And then the fifth step is death. You become identified by the sin. You start identifying yourself as whatever you did as a sin. It becomes your identity. 
unless you're a Christian. And then if you're a Christian, then first you can do First John 6. If we say that we have fellowship with him and yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say that we have no sin, we are deceiving ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Sozo happens because of Jesus. Sozo is the Greek word for salvation and it means healing and also means restoration. In Romans 6.23 you read, For the wages of sin is death, but the free, God, free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. So, when something happens and you want to know if you're sinning, identify the step you're in. If you haven't made it to step four yet, you have a chance at capturing the bat before he drops his guano and sin happens. Take every thought captive. Uh, regardless of where it's from or how it makes you feel, if you know it's wrong, Recall a verse or find a verse or verses to capture it with. And what I mean by that is you, uh, Jesus gave, well, let, let me just follow my notes instead of uh, free styling with it. Instructions to, to take thoughts and other such things as memories, captives. It's not just for thoughts. Memories. You can do this with memories too, and then the memories won't have that problem. That's what that was the big revelation that I had last week. Second Corinthians ten four through six. The weapons of our warfare are not physical weapons of flesh and blood. Our weapons are divinely powerful for the destruction of fortresses, you know, spiritual fortresses or things that are you know spiritual stuff. We are destroying sophisticated arguments. These are the things that are other than thoughts. There's arguments and every exalted and proud thing that sets, it, sets itself up against the true knowledge of God. So if you see something that happens, something in, in the world that conflicts with scripture, then you, you know scripture is right so that you know what you're looking at is not right. So we take it thought, we take that thought captives or we take that thing captive. And when we are taking every thought and purpose, there you go, thought and purpose captive to the obedience of Christ, now, Jesus modeled this for us. He did it in Matthew 4, 1 through 11. This is when uh, Jesus was tempted by Satan. <clears throat> and I'm just going to read it, and you can just kind of take what I just said and apply to what I'm reading, and you can see what I'm talking about. Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And after he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he then became hungry. And the tempter came to him, If you are the Son of God, command that these stones become bread. So the temptation there is God could, Jesus could have commanded the stones to become bread and he was hungry. So he was being tempted, but he answered and said, it is written, man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. So he had the temptation. And instead of taking the temptation, he wrapped it up with scripture with something that he knew to be true from God. Then the devil took, I just said, I said, I was just going to read it. And then here I am explaining it. Then the devil took him into the holy city and had him stand on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, if you are the son of God, throw yourself down for it is written, he will command his angels concerning you. And on their hands, they will bear you up so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Jesus said to him, on the other hand, it is written, you shall not put the Lord, your God to the test. So here we have Satan misquoting or, or quoting scripture out of context in order to get Jesus to sin. And he, co he covers that too. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him the ki all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, all these things I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. Then Jesus said to him, go Satan, for it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Then the devil left him and behold, angels came and began to minister to him. Now, how many time, more times do you think de the Satan tempted Jesus with those three temptations. I think that was it. And I think that's what it, what it is with us. Every time the thought comes back, if the thought does come back, you take it captive. Every time the thought comes back, that means that you didn't take captive. Well, it comes back with temptation. Every time the thought comes back with temptation, then you know that you didn't take it captive. But you're, but you're working on it. You should, it should be a weaker temptation. Then you know the bad is still flying. The temptation should be less unless you gave birth last time, which probably made it a stronger temptation. 
giving birth as in actually did the sin. Spray more word on it. If the thought comes and there's no temptation, it's on its last wings. Finish the job. The bat will die in captivity, never to return. We keep doing that. Eventually, we'll be walking how Jesus intended us to walk. Meditation. Dead man living. Oh, i got to keep going. This is anti-cordyceps. As sons of Adam, we're born dead spiritually and in general. God is a way for the innocent who are born dead. So don't worry about babies and stuff. We start out as the walking dead, at least on the inside. This is what Jesus had to say to the religious leaders in his day. Matthew 23, 27 through 28. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you are like whitewashed tombs, which out on the outside appear beautiful, but inside they are full of dead man's bones and all uncleanness. You too, out, uh, and all, uh, so you too outwardly appear righteous to men, but inwardly you are full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. It's basically saying they're, they're dead men, dead men who look good on the outside. So what does death mean in scripture? It's, it's not to stop functioning like, like the, a replicant in um, uh, Blade Runner or, or Data from Star Trek. A lot of these people try to make you think that those things are really alive and they're not. It means to be at, well, and death doesn't mean that anyway. It doesn't mean, it means to be separated from, disconnected, like in the sleep paralysis thing up above. When we were, when you're suffering from sleep paralysis, in a way you're dead to your body. You don't feel it and it doesn't respond to you. And that's, that's what uh, death is. In Genesis if you read Genesis two and three, you'll read about the day about uh, God talking to Adam and he's talking about on the day you eat of the Koge, what I call the Koge fruit, K-O-G-A-E, all caps, knowledge of good and evil, Koge fruit, you shall die. It's not an apple. Everybody seems to think it's an apple. A lot of people do. It's not an apple. It's, it's the knowledge of this fruit from the knowledge of the tree of good and evil. On the day you eat of that, you shall die. So even Adam and Eve died in Genesis on the day they ate of the fruit, but it doesn't appear that to us. Eve dies from eating the fruit as a result of being deceived by the serpent. Adam dies from eating the Koge fruit of his own free will. He wasn't deceived. That was the only way he could die since he didn't know good from evil. He hadn't eaten from the tree yet, so he can't know good from evil. The only way he could have died or sinned was to, do, was to eat from the fruit because that was the only thing that God told him not to do. <clears throat> Adam was tempted to choose Eve over God by eating, and he did it. He knew he would die, and that way he could be with his bride, though she was as good as dead. Jesus comes and gets his bride, the church, from the dead, bringing her into eternal life. I'll say that again. Jesus comes and gets his bride, the church, from the dead, bringing her into eternal life. I wonder if that was part of God's plan for Adam if Adam had chosen not to eat. Adam eats, Adam dies. If you look at the verses, it may not look like that he died on that day, but they did. They died spiritually. His spirit, the part of him breathed into him by God, the part of him that connected him to God, was separated from God. It was now severed from God. That's spiritual death. God refers to the lost as being dead in their sins. That's what he means by that. He means that they're separated from him and in their sins, and believers as dead to sin, <clears throat> separated, we're separated from sin because of what Jesus did on the cross, but alive to God. So when you read dead in scripture, think separated, and then try to figure out what it's separated from. This is Ephesians 2, 1 through 10, and you were dead, separated from God, in your trespasses and sins, in which you formerly walked according to the course of this world. Here's the world. According to the prince of the power of the air, there's the devil. He's not in hell, folks. He's still around. Of the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. That's the flesh, our, our corrupt human spirit. Among them, we too formerly lived in the lusts of our flesh, the strong desires of fallen man, indulging the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, even as the rest. But God, being rich in mercy, mercy, not getting what we deserve, he took, he, the wrath was poured out on Jesus. So we deserve wrath, but we don't get it. 
So that's where the mercy comes in. Because of his great love which, with which he loved us, uh, that's agape love, sacrificial love, the kind of love that, uh, the kind of hero movies where the hero sacrifices himself, the kind of, that kind of love. Even when we were dead, our transgressions, in our, when we were dead in our transgressions, disconnected from him and wallowing in our spiritual filth, our guano, made us alive together with Christ <clears throat> by grace. God's righteousness at Christ's expense, you have been saved, made completely whole, and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Do you feel it? <clears throat> yeah, I don't either. Nevertheless, you are there because the scripture says it. When you be, accept Jesus as your Savior, you're seated with Jesus in heavenly places somehow. So that in the ages to come, he might show the surpassing riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace, God's righteousness at Christ's expense, you have been saved through faith, a belief that can sense things from the other side. And that, not of yourselves, that supernatural faith did not come from, or supernatural belief did not come from us. It was given to us by God. It is the gift of God. There you go. It is the gift of God. Not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. That also sounds great, right? But that's not how we think. When we become born again, born from above, we have the fleshly mind that exists in the soul along with its old ways of thinking. But we get a spiritual mind and the mind of Christ. So we get three minds. Romans 8, 7. Because the mind set on the flesh is hostile toward God, for it does not subject itself to the law of God, for it is not even able to do so. That's, that's the flesh, uh, the carnal mind. The natural state of this mind is against God. It generates all kinds of thoughts that are contrary to God. We need to use our spiritual mind to manage the carnal mind. And it may be that these two minds are the same thing, but the way I got it in my head right now, they're separate. We have a spiritual mind and a carnal mind, and the idea is to move out of the carnal mind and into the spiritual mind and then manage the carnal mind because the carnal mind is what's used to navigate around in this world. It means carnal means meaty. So it's just basically the, the mind that's used to, to uh, walk in this world by, and obeying the, world, the, the laws that are in this world, the physical laws that are in this world. But the carnal mind doesn't know anything about the spirit. So it doesn't know anything about those minds. So it's like a program, a computer program. It's not designed to work with anything, but you know, I'm freestyling. This is Romans 12. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may prove, experience firsthand for ourselves what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect, perfect meaning complete. A lot of people use this verse to talk about God's perfect will versus God's permissive will. Uh, but everything is his permissive will because he can stop everything anytime he wanted to, really. So permissive will is really nothing to talk about. Um, so that you may prove, experience firsthand for ourselves, what the will of God is. You can't, you can't experience what the will of God is for ourselves unless you renew your mind. That's what the scripture verse is saying. So you've got to renew your mind. This is 1 Corinthians 2, 15 through 16. But he who is spiritual appraises all things, yet he himself is appraised by no one. For who has known the mind of the Lord that he will instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. One brain, three minds. Colonel, spiritual, and the mind of Christ. As believers, we are saved, but we are left instructions to grow up into the fullness of Christ. That's in Ephesians 4. And to offer ourselves as living sacrifices, not dead sacrifices, living sacrifices, which is how we're supposed to worship. We're not supposed to be doing this. That, that's how we're supposed to worship, not be in church doing it. We're supposed to be offering ourselves as living sacrifices. And to not be molded into the ways of this world. This is continuing no, this is me. <laughs> and to not be molded into the ways of this world, but to be transformed by the renewing of our minds so that we may experience and see for ourselves what the complete will of God is down here, not up there. We we're supposed to come down. We're supposed to get there down here, not up there. I mean, we get to it up there if we don't get to it down here, but it, just think of the glory you can bring to God if you can get to it down here. So, that basically was Romans. I was just paraphrasing it, I guess. 
As believers, we are saved, Romans 12. As believers, we are saved, but we are left instructions to follow. We need to make sure we, we realize we are immersed, inextricably entangled into the sun. That's baptized. We're immersed and inextricably entangled into the sun. Baptized means to, to dip or uh, I've gone over this before. It's baptizo or bapto. Bapto is only used four times, and it means to briefly dip in water. That's basically what happens when you're water baptized. But you, they don't use that word for water baptized. They use baptizo, which means to hold under until you become one with what you're being hold under in. So when you're baptized into Christ, you are become one with Christ. So we're inextricably entangled. We're baptized into the Son, the Spirit, and the Father. So let me reread that. Shoot. Got into another sermon. As believers, we are saved, but we are left instructions to follow. We need to make sure we realize we are immersed and inextricably entangled, baptized into the Son, the Spirit, and the Father. We should become a living sacrifice and renew our minds as instructed in Romans 12, which is how we're supposed to worship, and to not be molded into the ways of this world, but to be transformed by the renewing of our mind so that we may experience and see for ourselves what the complete will of God is down here, not up there. We need to grow up, <laughs> I've repeated a lot, we need to grow up into the fullness of Christ, as it says in Ephesians 4. We should move on and forward. How will we know when we get there? We will be walking as Jesus walked. We'll be doing the things that Jesus did and taught his disciples to do and taught his disciples to teach others to do. The fruit of the Spirit will be forever present with us. In Galatians 5, you can read about that in Galatians 5, 22 through 23. John 14, 12. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me, the works that I do, shall he do also. And greater works than these shall he do, because I go unto my Father. This is just proof that what I said was scriptural. We are supposed to be walking down here like Jesus, and this was proof of it. John said that, I mean, Jesus said in John, verily, verily, this is mean, basically means truth bomb. I say unto you, he that believeth on me, the works that I do, shall he do. And greater works than these shall he do, because I go unto my Father. Now, the reason we do the works, the reason we're able to do the works is because Jesus went to the Father. Hebrews 6, 1 through 3. Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on unto perfection, completion, fully mature, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God, of, do, of the not uh, toward God of the doctrine of baptisms. This is a list and of laying on. A, I should repeat it again. Not laying again, the foundation of repentance from dead works, not laying again, the foundation of faith toward God, not laying again, the foundation of the doctrine of baptisms, not laying again, the foundation of laying on of hands, not laying again, the foundation of for resurrection of the dead and of eternal judgment. This will we do if God permit that is, go on to perfection. And this we will do if God permit. I'm there by no means. I'm not, I'm not, I'm preaching to myself just as much as I'm preaching to you guys. I'm not there by any means, but it seems to be a worthy and reachable goal based on what I've read in scripture. And this will we do if God permits. Okay, jump starting. Just do it. This is a little, <laughs> this is a carnal video. <laughs> this is, uh, oh, what's his name? He's inspiring. I used to like him, but he's kind of gone off the deep end. Okay, jump starting. Shia LaBeouf. <laughs> Shia LaBeouf, just do it. And also there's a video on Magic School Bus. Um, just starting. It's just do it. It's it, Arnold is in the in the Magic School Bus thing you're going to see here. Arnold is, is the flesh. It's, a lot of times the flesh says, oh, I don't want to go. I don't go. And then the, and the spirit is like Miss Frizzle. She's like, let's go. Let's take chances, make mistakes. And that's basically what you got to do. You got to go out there, jump starting, go out there with the idea that you're going to do the best you can. You're going to make mistakes. You're going to learn from the mistakes and then keep going. Just try to be as sensitive as you can to the spirit. Miss Frizzle is the spirit in this case. Be as sensitive to the spirit as possible so that you won't make as many mistakes. <clears throat> But it's uh it's kind of like the uh, uh you guys that swim this is when there uh, some of you guys that swim you kind of eat it's time to swim you ease into the water it's cold so you just kind of ease into the water this is not the way to do it <clears throat> if you do it for any length of time you realize the best way to get into the water no matter how cold it is is just to jump in 
Um, Jesus on the streets, since it's close to uh, my, my kids were watching a bunch of scary stuff, scary movies. I kept on trying to interject. I'd go in there every once in a while and watch and then interject something, you know, like if it was a haunted house or something. I said, oh, yeah, yeah, we can do that as a Christian. Uh, well, Tom and uh, have a Fisher who used to live in Charlotte. They live in Florida now. This is a video of them cleaning house. They're, they're helping out this uh, this person who has got uh, – she's got spirit troubles in her house. That's the only way I'm going to describe it. And in it, they'll be talking about familiar spirits. And what a familiar spirit is, is a familiar spirit is a, all that is is a spirit that just hangs around a certain person. Um, they call them familiars. But they talk about familiar spirits in there, so I just wanted you to know what they are. Um, they also talk about orbs in here. I don't know if y'all know about orbs, but orbs are, uh, you can YouTube it, look for it if you want, but a lot of people think orbs are spirits, and you can't really see them with a naked eye, but you can see them on video, the videos, when you take videos of them, when you take pictures of them. And one time, well, I, my kids and I were at a um, hotel that was supposed to be haunted, and I knew about orbs, and I was just taking pictures. <clears throat> I was hoping to capture something since it was a haunted hotel. But it was at a wedding, and um, they get, there was a guy speaking, and I was taking pictures. <clears throat> Excuse me. And um, when I got the pictures back, I noticed they were digital. I noticed that the picture that I took of the speaker and the crowd, it was, it was uh, underexposed, oddly. But there was a real bright dot right over the uh, speaker's head. So I said, I wonder what that is. So I zoomed in on it, and it was an orb. It was an orb right over the speaker's head, and it had two dots for eyes and a smiley face. <laughs> I tried to find it, but I couldn't find it. So an orb, a lot of, time, a lot of people believe orbs are a uh, physical manifestation of spirits where they, where they move around. So that's, I'm just telling you that so you'll know what you're looking at when, they, when you see this video. They, the people in the video know what uh, those all are. Uh, this is also in this video. It's got the 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 person who owns the house accepting Jesus as their savior. Uh, the dog noticing a difference in her afterwards. Um, a physical mir miracle happening, what I call the big goosebump, you know, from goosebumps, and, and a postscript by um, Tom and Ahava Fisher. So check that out. <clears throat> Also, it, down below will be Zealous Evangelism and Signs, Win, and Atheist. Now, this has got Dead Man Living in it, how it's done, what a word of knowledge is, how that worked, uh, blessing someone, uh, an example of an atheist being won over to Christ, um, a demon being delivered, how it's not a placebo effect. A lot of people think it's a placebo effect. And the gospel presentation, the gospel is presented there, and how faith is required to believe. But we're given faith. Uh, vision being healed. This is a long one. This is a half an hour long, but it's worth watching. And, uh, and it also, Ahava gives testimony about how she was an unbeliever and saw vision of Jesus and knew who he was by the Holy Spirit being upon her. You know, I was telling you that before. She wasn't born again yet, but she knew who Jesus was and saw him before. So check that video out. Uh, Father, thank you for everything you do for us. Thank you for uh, your marvelous mercy that you've taken wrath out of the way from us and poured out your spirit and poured out grace on us and have made it as easy as possible to be born again. Help us to realize that. Help us to share our faith with others so we can bring others into your kingdom and bring glory to your name. Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you guys for coming back and visiting on Saturday, nine o'clock coffee. And an hour and a half. Man, that is the longest one yet. It's going to be interesting to see how many people actually watch this. Okay. See you guys.